All right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the IS uh, Distinguished uh, Lecture. And, uh, and thank you all, especially for coming in spite of the heavy rain. As the uh, old Chinese wisdom says, only the important people comes when it starts to rain, rain very hard, right? It's a lot of water means uh, the important people visit us. Um, so uh, I also noticed that there's a big crowd outside, I believe is for a uh, big data forum. And uh, it doesn't matter the data is big or small, we have to write software right, to, to implement them. So indeed, uh, software today, actually, our quality of life depend on the quality of software. And uh, we know that software is nothing but instructions written by humans, uh, which is naturally not very reliable, right? So how do we devise machines and techniques to forecast, to predict the behavior of the software before it is incarnated on the machine, right? That is the job of static program analysis. And that is where Professor Reps have made a tremendous contribution and is one of the best known scholar in this field of our time. So Professor uh, Thomas Reps, uh, he received his PhD in computer science from Cornell University in 1982 and joined uh, University of Wisconsin Madison in 85 and remained there uh, till today. He is currently the J. Barclay Rosser Professor and Rajiv and Ritu Batra Chair in Computer Sciences in the department in the um, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. So uh, Professor Rep's research focuses on a wi wide variety of topics um, it, uh, revolving around program analysis, including program slicing, data flow analysis, pointer analysis, model checking, computer security, code instrumentation, language-based program development environments, and the use of program profiling and software testing, software renovation, incremental algorithms, and attribute grammars. Professor Reps received numerous awards, including NSF Pres Pres Presidential Young Investigator Award, a Packard, uh, a Packard Fellowship, a Humboldt Research Award, and the Guggenheim Fellowship. He was also elected as ACM Fellow in 2005. In 2013, Professor Reps was, was elected as a foreign member of the Academia uh, Europina. So, um, and his, his bio doesn't mention it. He's also pretty successful in applying static analysis in a commercial world. He's also the president of Grammatech, which is one of the prominent uh, static analysis tool vendor uh, in, the, in the United States. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce, and let me pass the mic to uh, Professor Thomas Reps. Thank you, Charles, and uh, thank all of you for, thanks for coming out in the, in the rain. Uh, now I know who the important people are. Uh, okay, Charles told me this morning that he got several uh, email messages from people saying, I'm planning to come, but I didn't understand anything in the abstract. Uh, and, and here's the title of this talk. So what does this mean? So rather than explain the title concept by concept, let me try and summarize it in, in, one, in one picture. Let me start out by saying that uh, one of the wonderful things, one of the things that I hope you take away from this talk is one of the wonderful things about computer science. So as with all fields of knowledge, it's divided into subfields, which I've shown notation, notionally by these, by these ovals. But because of the universal nature of computing, it turns out that ideas in one subfield can sometimes have 
interesting connections with the ideas in other subfields. And so the point of this talk, the work that I'm going to describe, is going to tell you about interesting connections that we made between a programming language's software engineering problem and some old ideas in machine learning and automated reasoning. So the talk is neither about the left end, left end or the right end of this line, but ideas that are common to both. Now, my expertise is on the right end of the line. Uh, I'm going to start at the right end. I'll try and give you enough background so that you understand the problem that we were, that we were faced with and the direction in, that, we, that we took. Uh, some parts of the talk may veer into technical language uh, at one end or the other, but my hope is that even if you don't follow everything, uh, you can get the gist of what my students and collaborators and I have been trying to do. And then if you get lost, uh, I've marked some of the points with a light bulb. Uh, where, where, and these are places where I hope you can get at least the, the, the high level, the, where at least the high level point comes across and you can get back on board uh, with, the, with the bigger picture. Now, as Charles said, I do a lot of work on static program analysis. It's a field that originally was developed for use in the opti optimizing uh, phases of compilers. But by the late 90s, there was a bit of an issue for the field because the computer architects had done such a good job of putting things in hardware that made programs run faster that you could work awfully hard and only get a 2% or 3% improvement in the performance of your program. So fortunately for the field, around that time, it became uh, computer security became increasingly important. And it turned out that static program analysis was one of the techniques that you could use uh, in order to gain greater assurance that your program didn't contain security vulnerabilities. Now, I'm sure you all have a favorite example of a disastrous bug. But one of my favorite ones was, uh, comes from 1998. I heard about it at a talk uh, by Peter Lee, then of Carnegie Mellon, now of Microsoft Research. This was a problem that came up on the first trial at sea of a, of a US, uh, I'm not quite sure, a destroyer. Um, what happened was, what, if you look on the web, what it's described as in this C trials, somebody entered a zero into the data field of a certain database manager program. It caused something to overflow, uh, and it crashed all the, 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 the consoles and other terminals. And the net result was the ship was dead in the water for uh, almost three hours before the Navy decided to tow it back into port. Now, Peter Lee, when he described it in his talk, had a different explanation. That the zero was actually entered into a kitchen inventory program. So something that should never have anything to do with the control of the ship. Uh, there was some complicated linkage path and a, and a rather dramatic side effect of, uh, of entering the zero caused the ship to just go dead in the water. Now, I should say, I tried to, I tried to find backup for this uh, by looking on the web. And all I found were my own slides from a talk that I had uh, posted uh, 10 years ago. So uh, this, may just be, uh, uh, this may just be rumor. But I did hear it from Peter, uh, from Peter Lee like that. OK, so this suggests that one might have a tool that could track information to try and discover problems like this. So obviously, the analysis must track numeric information to find where these zeros are and where they can flow. But from your experience, you ought to know that it's not just, um, uh, it's not just the zeros. The, the, it can be the result of a computation that you get a zero. And that, uh, so you need to track values other than zero. Also, your values don't necessarily sit in integer variables. They could be. Uh, they could be pointed to by other variables, and so it could be computations like this. So you need to track pointers. And it's not just pointer addresses taken of local variables or global variables, but it could also be a heap allocated storage. Okay. So the problems actually here are endless. The potential is the following, that static analysis gives you a way of determining information about the possible situations that can arise at execution time without actually running the program on specific inputs. What happens uh, operationally is that uh, one runs the program on descriptors that represent collections of inputs. And by that means, you're actually running the program on a, on a, uh, 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 on a collection of inputs. So the theory that, 
underlies the, um, this field of program analysis is called abstract interpretation. And it was developed about 1975 by Patrick and Radio Cuzo. Now, it has many, this theory has many beautiful aspects, but it also has a reputation of being uh, a kind of black art and hard to work with successfully. Now, when I look back on some of the things that I've done over the past uh, two decades, I now see that I've been engaged in a 20-year in a effort to raise the level of automation in this subject and to try and get rid of some of the, the black art. And so I want to describe parts of this work in the remainder of the talk. Now, some of the work was, was motivated by um, uh, work on trying to track uh, heap allocated storage, the, the programs that manipulate linked data structures. Uh, there's far too, and, and others, uh, uh, Another aspect of this effort was when I was working on machine cut analysis. There's far too much material here to talk about this in a single talk, so I'm going to concentrate on sort of the most recent advance, which is what we call symbolic abstraction. And I'll explain what I mean by uh, symbolic abstraction. So for those of you who are interested in static analysis, who are, who are trying to become static analysis experts in the audience, I should say that I'm going to be giving a version of this talk at VMKI. And for that talk, I wrote a companion paper that that covers all three of these. So you might find that of, uh, that of interest. <clears throat> OK, so what do I mean by automating abstract interpretation? One way to think about it is that we'd like to make abstract interpretation push button to the same degree that, say, parser generation tools made parsing push button. So you have to think back to your uh, undergraduate um, compiler class, where you may have used tools like Flex and Bison uh, in order to write lexical analyzers and, uh, and, and parsers. So let's think about what it meant to automate the subject of parsing. So a parsing problem uh, has two, two inputs. You have a context-free language and a string to be parsed. So the thing about this is that the string changes more frequently than the language. Another thing is that there's a formalism for describing context-free languages, context-free grammars, and the tool then takes an instance of this, uh, of this formalism, a specific context-free grammar that describes the language to be parsed. And what it gives you back is a parsing function, such that if you execute that function on the string to be computed, then you get the result of that parse. Okay, so that was theory that was developed in the, late, uh, in the late 60s and 70s that went into that tool. Now, so what does it mean to automate program analysis? We want to follow a similar scheme, which I'll tell you about in a second, but first, I want to motivate you know, why one would want to invest the time doing so. So for me, the need to devise a way to automate abstract interpretation really hit home about 10 years ago, uh, even though I'd been working on a related kinds of things for about 10 years. This was after I'd spent a few, a few years working on tools to analyze low-level code, assembly language and machine code. And we were working with the Intel x86 instruction set, which has several hundred instructions. And my students were implementing numerous analyses. For each of these, they went back to the you know, four-inch thick uh, manual and the instruction, uh, uh, for the instruction set to look at the semantics of each instruction. And they would find you know, descriptions of what that instruction was doing. But it went on for pages and pages. And they had to do this for each of the analyses that they were doing. And we were using something like uh, eight or nine different analyses. So this really was not sort of conceptually scaled, very difficult. We sometimes had inconsistencies in the descriptions that came out, in the abstract uh, transformers that, that came out from this work. And it was creating bugs in our program analysis tools. So the question is, you know, what to do about it? My students, this was what the world looked like. So in 2006, we began to work on a system, what we call TSL. It was for creating machine code analyses directly from a specification of the instruction set semantics and the uh, set of descriptors on which the analysis was to be based. Now, that's the subject of a different talk. And I want to say a little bit more about program analysis in general before moving on to the, the, the topic of symbolic abstraction. Now, the other thing, uh, one thing that you have to realize about this is that like many problems in computer science, we're struggling with undecidability. Almost all of our problems that we want to solve are undecidable. We want to know a property P that holds 
sorry, property phi that just that holds whether that holds just before a particular statement of some program. And this simply can't be done in general. But we have a way of dodging it. The way we dodge it is, is we use one-sided algorithms. So the way it works is this, that your program has a set of reachable states, and there's something, there's some collection of bad states. What you hope is that things look like this, that the reachable states do not include any of the bad states. And there is a way, so you, you hope that there is this kind of separation. There's a way of over-approximating the reachable states, where by means of a process of successive approximation, and I'll be a little bit more concrete about this in a few minutes, you can find an over-approximation of the states. And if that over-approximation is still separable from the bad states, then you're happy. You've shown that none of the reachable states could reach any of the bad states. Okay? On the other hand, there are a couple of other situations that can occur. There could be a false positive where your apparently reachable states do intersect with the bad states, and you can't really distinguish between that situation and this situation where there's a true intersection between the reachable states and the bad states. So there you have to use other techniques, refine the abstraction. Uh, uh, okay, so there's a, a second reason why program analysis is difficult, and that has to do with what I'll just term infinities. Whether they're infinities or just very large is a kind of uh, question we can debate about, but, uh, but the problem is that we have very, very large state spaces that we have to deal with, and we have very large or infinite answer sets that we have to be able to manipulate. So where do these infinities come from? Well, we have our base types, 2 to the 32 or 2 to the 64, integers, uh, floating point numbers, strings, user-defined types, pointers, procedure calls, uh, uh, concurrency, you have an unbounded number of threads, okay? And the list goes on and on and on and on. So in a way that's good for people who work in this area, it means uh, full employment for the future, but it also means that the problems we face are, are, are difficult. And partly as a result of this issue, we have this reputation of, of being a kind of black art and difficult to work with. Okay, there have been successes in the field. I'll, I'll mention a couple of, of the most notable ones. The, SLAM project, or the Static Driver Verifier at Microsoft, uh, is a tool for finding possible bugs in Windows device drivers. And this, this actually, this was done in the early 2000s. It was an example of a, of a, of a perfect storm of, uh, uh, of events. Uh, uh, in, uh, Windows, Windows was uh, unstable because of poorly written device drivers that were written not by Microsoft programmers, but by people working for other companies. Uh, they weren't the uh, people who had graduated with, a, with an A average who had been hired by Microsoft. They were device drivers that were, that were written by people with a C average who were hired by, uh, by device companies. And the problem was that from Microsoft's point of view, or from Microsoft users' point of view, every time your operating system crashed and you got a blue screen, it looked to you like it was a problem that was coming from Microsoft. By using the computers that were available at the time, by using analysis techniques that had been developed by our research community and developing some new techniques of their own, Tom Ball and Sriram Rajmani were able to create a tool that could find possible bugs in these de device drivers. And Windows, partly as a result of that and partly of other things that Microsoft did, became much more stable in subsequent years. The Astray system was done by the Cousos and their team at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in, in Paris. And it was developed to vet Airbus flight software for runtime errors. Now, in a way, this system serves to motivate uh, the material in this talk. It took a team of about 10 highly skilled cream of the crop PhD students at the best university in, in France uh, to, to create this system. And every time they encountered a new problem that their software was reporting as a potential problem in the Airbus software, they often had to create, uh, they had to, had to do innovative work in the field of abstract interpretation in order to figure out whether this really was a, a problem or not. So I sometimes like to say, Astray scales linearly, but it scales linearly in the number of ENS PhD students you have on hand. 
Okay, so here's what I want to do in the remainder of this talk. Uh, I want to give you a gentle introduction to abstract interpretation, go through three insights that, that uh, came about over a period of about a dozen years, uh, or 10 years, and uh, say a little bit about what we're doing in the way of creating, of using some of these ideas to create a, a parallel satisfiability solver, and then uh, wrap up. Okay, so to see how program analysis works, let's consider a simple expression, and uh, the concrete semantics of this, of course, is established by your normal arithmetic tables. Of course, these could be tables of bounded arithmetic if we're going to implement, uh, use this on a, on a machine. And the way you, sorry, the way you evaluate this is bottom-up evaluation, uh, plugging in given particular values for A and B, and working your way from bottom to top. Now, the abstract semantics, if we're doing, say, parity analysis, is given by some alternative tables. And this is what is meant by abstract interpretation. We have three descriptors, question mark, O, and E, this standing for odd, this standing for even, and this standing for, I don't know, could be any value at all. Okay? And our table of uh, the abstract plus is that odd plus odd is even, even plus even is even, et cetera. Okay? And the way um, one uses this is you would start to evaluate. You don't even have to be given specific values for A and B. You can use the question mark value there, saying you don't know what the value is. Every time you get to an operator, you consult the table. Uh, even times question mark is even, so you know to label this node here with even, and you proceed like that bottom up. And here, what happens is we know that at the top we get O, which means that we have a kind of type. It says it doesn't matter what you have for the inputs, you're always going to get an odd output. Okay? So that is a, that's, a, that's an example of a property that we've established for the root or for the final answer of evaluating that expression. Now, each of these descriptors means something. That's known as concretization. The meaning of a, of a descriptor is a set of concrete values. So O are all the odd values, E is all the even values, and the, the fact that the reason we have an entry in O plus E equals O is because if you take any value from here and any value from here, you're going to end up with a value over, over here. Let me give you a second example. So this is what's known as uh, the kind of analysis that one would use in a compiler for constant propagation. Uh, we have these uh, transformers that represent the semantics of things. We would have descriptors that say, I don't know whether i is a constant. I don't know anything about the value of i and j. Okay? After this assignment, we know that i is 0. We don't know anything about j. Propagate this sort of thing across here, around the loop. At this point, we have to take the join or, or somehow do a merge of information that is coming from here and coming around this back edge. So here, we know that j is going to be 0, but we have to somehow describe both 0 and 1 for i. Well, in this domain, the only thing we can do is, is give it a question mark. Okay? And we keep doing this until everything quiesces, and we have values at every one of these points that are consistent with the predecessors. So here, what we've established is that j has to be 0 at the end of the program. We don't know anything about the value of i. So this is what I, when I use this kind of picture about successive approximation as a way of exploring the state space of the program, that's what I, this propagation of these things in square brackets, that's what these successively larger ovals are referring to. Okay, so now what does it mean to automate abstract interpretation? That's the central question I want to deal with. So here we have the meaning function for a programming language. We, we actually have three inputs, and we want to be able to interpret, uh, do, do some kind of interpretation step with respect to these three inputs. We're going to have the meaning function for a programming language. We're going to have uh, a, dis, a domain or a set of abstract descriptors, and we'll have a particular one of these abstract descriptors that represents the set of pre-states. We want this value to give us back the post-state, the abstract descriptor that represents the, the post-state. Okay? So our goal is we want to be able to take a specification of the semantics of the programming language, a specification of our descriptors, and output a function such that if we feed it an, a pre-state descriptor, we get the post-state descriptor. Now, this leaves open some questions. 
what formalism should we use to specify the, uh, the semantics of the programming language, and what formalism should we use to specify this domain of descriptors. So we'll come back to that uh, in a second. Now, I said abstract interpretation was formulated by the Cousseaux. Uh, it's a beautiful theory. And what it does is it links the domain of descriptors, which I'm going to show as this diamond here. It's a lattice, a partial order, with the lowest element representing the empty set of states over in the concrete domain, the largest element representing the universe, or the entire set of states, over in the concrete domain. And each oval here is some, sub, is some set of, of states. Now, you can only represent certain kinds of information in an abstract domain. So for example, if we use intervals, and we, we start with this pair of concrete states, the best representative of that is something where we say x has a value between 2 and 5, and y has a value between 1 and 3. We have the 2 from here, the 5 from here, the 1 from here, and the 3 from here. But now if you think about what this point represents, it represents a larger set of states. It represents all of these up, up here, where there's any value in the range 2 to 5 for x and any value in the range 1 to 3 for y. Okay? You simply cannot describe precisely this inner oval over in the abstract domain. You're deliberately giving up the power to circumscribe certain sets. Okay? Now, it has the property that if you took this set and you abstracted it, you would get exactly back uh, this, this point. Here's another thing about abstract interpretation. Once you've picked your abstract domain and you want to, act, and you want to uh, evaluate uh, a pre-state to post-state transformer, there's a limit to how precise you can be. And the limit to precision can be described by going to the concrete domain, applying your transformer to that set, and by that I mean applying the transformer individually to each member of that set, and then taking the result set, which is this, and abstracting that. So that transformation is called the best abstract transformer with respect to whatever the concrete transformer is for this abstract domain A. Okay? So that establishes uh, a, a sort of platform, a, 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 a goal which we would like to achieve. We want to get the best over approximation, which is uh, the best over approximation of applying the transformation to the concretization of our input. Anything that is, represents something larger than that is still safe, and we can use that in our, in our process of successive approximation. Now, the degree to which there's a gap over here in this domain of, of descriptors, that translates to a loss of precision and corresponds to a gap over here, the extra green elements that are included in what that descriptor represents. OK, unfortunately, the Cousseaux gave no algorithms for doing this. This was just a theoretical construct. And what we would really like to do in automating abstract interpretation is be able to apply the best abstract transformer or create a descriptor itself of the best abstract transformation. OK, now there's some challenges here. So one is not immediately obvious, actually, which is that abstract interpretation is inherently non-compositional. So this ought to make you uncomfortable. If you're a computer scientist in the audience, you should be uncomfortable. The reason is that the basis of so, much, so many definitions, so much of our foundational stuff in computer science is based on compositionality. And we have to abandon that. Our languages are expressed using context-free grammars. Many concepts and properties are defining, defined using inductive de definitions. Often, when you are traversing Data structures, you're doing recursive tree traversals. It's all compositionality. Okay? So let me give you an example. The problem is that if you have the expression x plus uh, minus x, and you're evaluating it in intervals, say five to, x has 5 to 10 and y has whatever it has, what you're going to do if you are just blindly working your way up this abstract syntax tree for the expression You'll take the interval 5 to 10 here, it will become the interval minus 10 to minus 5 here. When you do the addition of these two intervals, you'll get the interval minus 5 to, to 5. Okay? Whereas, you know, if you look at that expression, the minus x cancels with x, and you should get the, you would like to have gotten, the tighter value 
zero, zero, the tighter interval zero, zero. So compositionality, in other words, step-by-step -step evaluation of the, of the expression tree, you get something which is safe, it's an over-approximation, but it's not as tight as what you would like to get. That's what I mean by having to give up compositionality. Okay, and there's another aspect of this is that even if you have a collection of best abstract interpretation operators for the individual step of working your way up this abstract syntax tree or along a path in a control flow graph, their composition may not provide the best abstract, trans the best abstract, ans abstract answer. Okay? The composition of best transformers is not necessarily a best transformer itself. So that's what we're up against. So now, in the rest of the talk, I want to tell you about some work that my students and collaborators and I have done over the last dozen or so years. So the first glimmer of insight, although I didn't know it at the time, came from a conversation with a colleague of mine at Wisconsin, Jude Shavlik, who is well known in the area of machine learning. And he liked to be controversial, and he would sometimes mutter things like, 40% of the people in our department, the Wisconsin Computer Science Department, are doing machine learning but don't know it. Now, Every subfield of computer science likes to view its problem as being the central problem, right? Our database colleagues like to view everything as a database problem. Our programming languages people want to view everything as a programming languages problem. Jude wanted to view everything as a machine learning problem. But I socialized with him. I had a conversation at a party. And uh, I, I decided to, to, uh, to pin him down on this. And I said, what can I read uh, to understand this remark better? I was about to go off to conference in Madrid in September of 2002. And so he gave me a copy of Tom Mitchell's book on uh, machine learning, which had come out a few years before. So we'll see shortly how this turned out to be related to work that Muli Sagiv, Greta Yorsh, and I did on harnessing logic to automate abstract interpretation. Uh, so <clears throat> in an earlier slide, when I was discussing abstract interpretation, I showed this kind of bubble this kind of bubble. This was the abstract domain of descriptors. This was the set of the universe of concrete states. Over in Madrid, Muli and, and I started to talk about this, and we introduced a third bubble, which was a logic, a, a, a set of logical formulas that sort of complemented these other two. And we posed the following problem. Suppose you had a formula in this logic. Well, that has a meaning function. The logicians give it, give it a meaning function. It describes a set of states. Now, what we would like to do is to map from the logic domain to the abstract domain and get a descriptor such that if we concretize it and find the set of states that this describes, it most tightly circumscribes the set of states that the formula describes. Okay, so we call that, that is symbolic abstraction. Instead of working from the states to our descriptors, we're working from this symbolic domain to our descriptors. So we call that, instead of the alpha function for abstraction, we call that the alpha hat function. We had to put some other symbol on it. Okay? So given a formula phi in the logic, the goal of a procedure for symbolic abstraction is to find the smallest element, A sharp, of the domain, the smallest descriptor, such that the meaning, concretization of A sharp, is a superset of the meaning of the formula. Now, Typically, the logic is a rich language, and A can be thought of as an impoverished logic fragment. Let me tell you about that. So we've, I've used this example of the domain of intervals. You can think of this abstract descriptor as really being this logical formula. If x is in the interval 5 to 10, it means x is greater than or equal to 5, and x is less than or equal to 10. Okay, so another way of stating, stating this is that the interval environments are the conjunctions of single variable inequalities. Okay, so there's a correspondence between the descriptors that we write, that we may write in a fashion like this, and elements in this logic. But it's an impoverished logic. There are only certain things you can write. You can't use, you can't, using things like this, you can't write two variable inequalities. You can't say x plus y is, is greater than or equal to 5. Okay? Now, <clears throat> This, this was kind of interesting because it, it now phrased the problem as a purely logical question, and it's something that you would think our logician friends would have addressed. We looked. We didn't find anything. Later, years later, we found some things in the 
artificial intelligence and machine learning literature. But at the time, we didn't find anything in the logic, in the logic literature. So this is a really fundamental approximation problem. If you have a formula in one logic, find the strongest consequence of that formula that's expressible in another logic. OK? It's like uh, uh, you speak uh, English, uh, you speak Cantonese. Uh, what if, it, you know, what, it, you, if you state something in English, what's the strongest thing that you can state that describes what you stated in English but in Cantonese? Logicians didn't seem to have addressed this problem. Um, OK, so let me look at an example. It's kind of a weird example. It has to goes back to the motivation of uh, machine code um, analysis. Uh, perhaps not the best example for a, a general audience, but, uh, but, but let's try it. So this is a, 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 a very strange instruction in the Intel uh, x86 instruction set. It adds the low order byte of the register, which is called EAX. So that low order byte is called AL. It adds it to the second to lowest order byte of the register EBX. That byte is called BH and sticks it in BH. So pictorially, it looks like this. You have your two registers. These are the two bytes in question. And you do this addition and stick it in here. Okay? So in our rich logic, if I want to describe that, it looks something like this. It doesn't matter what it says. Okay? It is saying that EBX, the post state value of EBX, is some transformation of the inputs of EAX, EBX, and then the EAX register is unaffected, the ECX register is unaffected, et cetera. Okay? The thing to note here is that it just involves some masking, uh, uh, a, a shift, which I've expressed here by multiplying by 256. Okay? <clears throat> so the point is that in, you need this rich logic if you're going to express the semantics of the programming language. But that may not be, none of these operators that you need may be part of the, uh, the impoverished logic that you're trying to use to describe things in your program analysis. So this answers sort of the first question. What formalism should we use to specify the semantics of the programming language? The answer is use logic. In our case, quantifier-free bit vector arithmetic. All right, so let me describe the procedure that we uh, that, we, uh, that we developed back in 2002. So here we have our three domains. We have a formula. That means this, its meaning is this set of concrete states circumscribed in yellow here. What we want is some point over here such that when we concretize it, it just encloses that area by as, with extra slop, as little extra slop as possible. So how does this work? Well, we assumed that we had we were, we were going to do a process of successive approximation. We were going to start from the least value, ask for a satisfying assignment. We assumed that we were able to map a single state over to a descriptor that described that state, and perhaps more. Take the join of that, the least upper bound of that. And then what we wanted to do, when we did this least upper bound, or when we, when we did this mapping over here, we may have described a larger set of states over here than just S alone. So now what we want to do is repeat this process, we, except we want to make sure that we get a value in here. Well, how do we do that? We can do that symbolically. We, can, we assume that we knew how to map back from the abstract descriptor to a formula. And now we just have to use the formula that says, give me something that satisfies phi, but not what we've already been given. Okay? And that's what we did. Go like this, you go around like that, you keep doing this, you work your way up, okay? And eventually, you get to a situation where you concretize, you do the symbolic concretization, you ask for a, a new satisfying assignment, it's unset. Unset doesn't make you unhappy, it makes you happy, because then you know you're done, okay? And what you've done in this process is you've climbed up the partial order, assuming that there are no infinite ascending chains, you will end up with the best value over here, this tightest over approximation, okay? All right, this algorithm is actually quite, quite simple. It's be stated in, in seven lines. Quite surprising, actually, that nobody had developed this in 25 years of abstract interpretation that had gone on before that. Let me, to make this more concrete, let's 
Let's actually run this on a specific example. In fact, we'll do it on the example that I had before, x plus minus x. Okay? So we're going to do this in the constant propagation domain. We start with the least value, the bottom element. Our formula is y is equal to x plus minus x. Okay? Our first iteration, we get some satisfying uh, store. x is 43, y is 0. Okay? So you can see this value is kind of arbitrary, but we're, we're pinned. y has to be 0. So we make that, uh, we have to take that over to the abstract domain. And so we get this value that bottom join 43,0 is 43,0. Okay. We concretize that uh, as symbolically. This is the formula x is 43 and y equals 0. Okay. And now we form, we use this as a blocking clause. And what we've done is done that step so far. Okay. Now what we're going to do is once we've got the blocking clause, we're going to get another satisfying assignment. Uh, let's say we get 46, 0. We take the join. We get x is top. We don't know anything about the constant values associated with top. x, sorry, associated with x. The symbolic concretization is simply that y is 0. We use that as the blocking clause. We ask for uh, a satisfying assignment, and we return the answer that uh, it is unsatisfiable. And that means we've worked our way up. And we've now covered everything that uh, needed to be covered. OK, so this now takes us to the second of the open questions. What formalism should we use to specify the abstract domain? Well, you can sort of extract it from the abstract data type that we needed in that seven line procedure. We need a way of uh, being able to take a descriptor and turn it into a logical formula. We need to be able to take a singleton state and uh, abstract it, turn it into a descriptor in the abstract domain. We need to know how to take the join between the abstraction of a singleton set and some value in the abstract domain. And we need to have a least element. Okay. So earlier I said that the first glimmer of insight came uh, when I when, I, when uh, Jude gave me Tom Mitchell's machine learning book. Well, when I flew over to Madrid, I didn't read the book. I did something else. Maybe I watched a movie. On the flight home, I said, OK, time to, time to actually learn this stuff. So I cracked open the book. And when I got to chapter two, there's a chapter about Tom Mitchell's own PhD thesis. And in there, he has an algorithm called FindS, which basically does the following. It is receiving a stream of labeled data positive examples and negative examples. It ignores the negative examples totally. And it takes the join in the concept lattice. That's the term that the machine learning people uh, use. It takes the join in the concept lattice, the least upper bound in the concept lattice, of all the positive examples. Okay? Very close. There are some differences. Uh, we don't have negative examples. We have, a, we have a precise statement of what we're trying to get. We have the formula phi. And we're using a satisfiability procedure in order to get samples. Okay? So it's not that we're measuring things from nature. We are asking for, uh, for new samples. And we're using blocking clauses to make sure that we're doing a kind of smart sampling, that we always get something new that is going to help us make progress. Okay? Now, there's an interesting thing in there, which is that Mitchell says in that chapter, the field moved. This algorithm was not resilient to noise in the data. And and, and the field of machine learning moved to statistical machine learning. But it left behind this algorithm. And we found a new use for this algorithm. That's kind of cool. In fact, when Mitchell came to visit Wisconsin, I described this. And I said, actually, I only want to talk to people like you who are machine learning people who have gray hair. Because you're old enough to know all of the algorithms that were forgotten because the field pivoted to work on different kinds of problems. What's different in our context is that we have a model, a precise statement of what it is that we want to, uh, to be learning, the, the, the concept that uh, circumscribes uh, our model. Whereas in uh, uh, the way machine learning is applied in the real world today, you don't have that kind of model. OK, so he actually had a, one, one or two suggestions. Uh, in, in fact, it didn't. Uh, in, didn't seem to have panned out, but, uh, but I, th I still think it's kind of cool. So 
Uh, I think those points were just uh, what I was saying. The find S algorithm is, uh, is that, and, and we had something that was a little bit related to that. Okay. All right, so here we have a connection. This problem of finding the strongest consequence of a formula that's expressible in a logic, that's finding the strongest concept uh, that, describes, uh, that describes the formula in a concept lattice, as, as in machine learning. All right, so when I have to present my work to uh, the people I ask for funds, I summarize things this way. The story, in a nutshell, is that it's essentially all symbolic abstraction. Basically, most of the key operations that you need if you're building a program analysis tool, uh, a static analyzer, can be captured as variants of the symbolic abstraction problem. Moreover, so I'm not going to explain what, what I mean by here, but this is the important point. We actually now know multiple algorithms for, for computing, for performing symbolic abstraction. I just showed you one. That was from 2002. I'll show you in a minute one from uh, a, a more recent work. Okay, so this is the second insight, second way, uh, a completely different way of giving an algorithm for, for symbolic abstraction. So this advance came about when my student, my then student, Aditya Thakur, and I started to study an old algorithm for propositional satisfiability called Stallmark's method. We didn't really, this was really, Aditya wanted to build a SAT solver, and he was just sort of looking around, and then we realized that it, it, it re was related to the symbolic abstraction problem. So what is this? So Stallmark's method has two kinds of rules. Uh, it has, first, Collection rules uh, are called propagation rules. So they work as follows. If you have some formula, some part of your formula, and you are, uh, what, you, what the algorithm is keeping track of are, um, are Boolean facts about the values of variables. If you know that the variable that represents the root of this production in the abstract syntax tree of the formula is true, then you know that these other variables must also be true. Right? If you had a fault at either of these, or both, you couldn't have true up here. So therefore, these things must be true. Similarly, if you had an or, and you know that v1 is false, then you know that v2 and v3 are, are both false. Okay? And so there are a collection of rules like this. But if you know that v1 is true and it's an or, well, then you don't know anything. The only thing, the best thing that you can do is just to, is just to say, well, my, my, my Boolean assignments are, are, are what I had before. What's interesting about Stallmark's method is that it has a second rule called the dilemma rule. So here you have your, your Boolean assignments. What you do is you make a split. Now other propositional satisfiability methods make splits. You choose a variable, you set the value to true for that variable in one branch and false in the other branch. Now you apply your propagation rules and you get sort of two new situations. But what's unusual about uh, Stallmark's method is that he then merges things back together by taking the intersection of the constraints that are represented by these sets of Boolean assignments. Okay? Now, the way to th you can think about this in a learning, as, as a way of learning. By doing propagation, you may have learned, you've learned some new things in R1 prime. By doing propagation over here, you've learned some new things in R2 prime. And what you're keeping is the common things that you have learned. Obviously, you're not V can't be one of, any facts about V cannot be in the common set, right? Because you made the assumption uh, that they were diametrically opposed. But other variables can now have been learned by, in, in, if, they've, if the same thing has been learned in the two branches, then you have mapped, uh, you know, then you have, have, have mapped down. If W is true over here and W is true over here, then W is true in the middle. <clears throat> okay. So Stallmark's method is really a method for checking unsatisfiability. Uh, basically, you start with the, the, uh, the fact that the root is true, and then it's kind of like a pump. And what you're trying to do is you hope that you work down to a set of inconsistent facts in both branches. And if you know that, then uh, you know that, um, that the formula that you started with is unsatisfiable. So here's the key insight that Aditya and I made. We looked at Stallmark from the perspective through the, the looking glass of abstract interpretation. And what we found was that Stallmark's method was really more general. 
It was a specific instance of something that was more general. We could abstract out, kind of like taking C code and turning it into a C++ template. We could extract out places where it was just using an abstract domain, and the abstract domain happened to be a specific abstract domain of Boolean assignments, or Boolean, uh, actually it was Boolean uh, qualities, but, but uh, what I've shown you here is just Boolean assignments, okay? And if we look at the, the essential elements of the dilemma rule from the lattice theory that abstract interpretation provides, what we see is that R, our descriptor, is just some point in this lattice. When we do a split, what we're doing is we're taking the meat with respect to two values that happen to cover A sharp, what A sharp describes. The propagation steps, that's a known thing in abstract interpretation called semantic reduction. Uh, and the merge step was really doing a join in this lattice. Now what's the importance? That, so all we did was we sort of changed terminology. But we changed terminology to terms that meant something in lattice theory and in abstract interpretation theory. And what it meant was that we had generalized from the specific thing that Stallmark had done in the early 90s to something that could be instantiated with different abstract domains. Okay? So it becomes a, a pump. You, what, what the pump looks like here is that you hope at some point you drive every, every branch down to bottom. If you can do that, the formula is unsatisfiable, and that the Stallmark procedure is just our generalized Stallmark instantiated with the equivalence domain. But there are other things that one can do. One can use implications. Uh, basically, you can put richer domains in here. So, for example, you can put in polyhedra. Uh, we also did things with bit vector affine equalities. So, let me describe an example with polyhedra. So, this is an example where uh, of, that, that corresponds to this picture here. Each inequality is represented by an edge, and these dotted edges are these disjunctions here. So these four things are represented by these four subformulas. Okay? And this diamond over here is these four subformulas. And then there's a final thing which represents this over here. Now, if you think about all of these inequalities, you'll realize that this formula is inconsistent. It's, it's unsatisfiable. So how are we going to show that? Well, what we're going to do is, uh, sorry, that's just an explanation of the formula. We're going to start with a lattice, and we're going to move things over. We're going to move down in the lattice from above. Every formula here will give us uh, 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 some facts. So from this black edge, we get these red edges. From this black edges, these black edges, we get these red edges. Okay, from that black edge, we get these red edges. So far, we haven't done very much except copy the edges over. Okay? But we do get some transitivity, right? From this red edge and this red edge, we get this red edge. But now we're blocked. So this is where we have to invoke the dilemma rule on these disjunctions. So we'll do a split. And the split, we will assume that this holds over here and that this holds over here. And now we'll follow the consequences of that. So from this red edge and this green edge, we get this green edge. From this red edge and this green edge, we get, oops, sorry. From this, uh, how do we get this? Uh, sorry, from this path and this, sorry, from, uh, from this edge and this edge, we get this green edge. Okay, we'll do something similar down here. Like a, Get a couple more edges. From down, from, from here we get this red edge, this green, we get this green edge. Similarly, we get a green edge over here. Okay, and now we're we're finally stuck after this. Okay. And so what we do is we take the join. The join keeps things which are common. So that's this green edge and this green edge. Now we have to do another dilemma split. So in this dilemma split, we're going to assume that this inequality goes this way. Down here, we assume that this inequality goes this way, which is in direct contradiction to these green edges. So you, we can see that we're going to get bottom here and bottom here. And now we take the join. Lo and behold, we get bottom. 
So what, what have we done? We started here, we pushed things down, we did a split, we did another split, and we pushed and we got all the way down to bottom. Okay, so you can generalize this kind of example to K diamonds as a, as a benchmark. Uh, we ran this against Z3. Actually, when I gave this talk somewhere, people said, uh, you know, they don't even allow this kind of uh, example in the, in the SMT competitions because the standard satisfiability solvers are terrible at this. So, uh, but what happens here is that this, this goes pretty well. This goes linearly in the number of diamonds, uh, and we can scale out to 25 or more, you know, pretty far out there, okay? Whereas Z3 blows up after 20. Okay, so what I just showed you is a link between decision procedures and abstract interpretation. Now, a lot of people in the static analysis community have been using decision procedures in the last dozen years or so, but this is something different. This is a way of using the tools that we have already developed in static uh, analysis inside the decision procedures themselves to improve the decision procedure, to, to create improved decision procedures. And this idea is not tied to Stallmark's method. It basically says any method for symbolic abstraction can be used for this process. Because if you can show that a formula, that the, that the best uh, abstract descriptor of a formula is bottom, that means it describes any set of states, and then your formula is unsatisfiable. Okay, so we call that satisfiability modulo abstraction. Here's another thing. This method is actually also a method for computing symbolic abstraction. If you think about what's going on, this pump is causing you know, some, the meaning of the formula to be more and more tightly circumscribed. Now the thing that's different between symbolic abstraction and decision procedures is that we don't expect to get down to bottom. Okay? Now if you look at the decision procedure people, they're unhappy if they don't get down to bottom because that is a failed refutation. But we don't even, exp right? we expect to have satisfiable formulas. We just want to get our way down there. So what does this mean? This means that the generalized Stallmark procedure is performing symbolic abstraction. And it's really, you know, the answer, an answer that doesn't get to bottom is still interesting. So there's a message here. This is really a plea to decision procedure developers that they should generalize their APIs to make available the residuals of failed reductions, failed refutations. Okay, when, I give, when I've given this talk to people in my own area, I found that they sometimes are confused about what this talk is about because they hear what they want to hear. Some come away from it thinking, this was a talk about decision procedures. Some think this was a talk about static analysis. In fact, it, the talk is about a concept that in some sense subsumes both. Primitive of symbolic abstraction is dual, whoops, is, sorry, is dual use. It can be used inside decision procedures, and it can be used for the operations that are in that are needed in static analyzers, like applying the best transformer. Moreover, I've shown you that we now have two different ways of, of doing this. We can go from below, we can go from above. And there are certain advantages to being to, to going from above because. If you're going from below and you haven't got and you haven't quiesced, if you've got some, if you've been taking too many resources, if, if it's been taking too long in order to uh, complete this procedure, you can't stop in the middle. The best thing that you could do would be to say that it's just the top element for which you, you know, where you've learned nothing. But if you're working your way from above, you can stop at any time and at least you have some safe over approximation. Okay. A third insight is, was not our work, uh, but it turned out there was another group at Oxford that was doing, who'd, who had found a very similar, had, were making use of very similar ideas. But instead of using Stallmark's, Stallmark's method, they were using uh, uh, CDCL, DPLL SAT solvers and using them, uh, finding the abstract domains inside of them and generalizing the SAT solvers to better SMT solvers. Before I wrap up, I want to say a little bit about where we're taking this work. In recent years, what we've done is we've been working on a parallel SAT solver. The reason this was interesting is that the dilemma rule 
suggested that we should just split and run things on a bunch of processors. The dilemma rule is trivially parallelizable. Now, it also turned out that Stallmark's method is not competitive with modern SAT solvers. And so what we did is we used an existing CDCL solver called Glucose. We used a rule that is a little bit like the dilemma rule, but it's, it's actually not the dilemma rule. But here's how it works. You start with a formula. You make a split by assigning, uh, by, by making all the different assignments to, to k variables. So you end up with two to the k uh, subtasks. You put those on different machines. You run this uh, standard solver. Okay? And then each of those solvers contributes some learned clauses, which you then put together. Okay? So these are the clauses that are learned by standard CDCL techniques. And the union plus some subsumption check goes into this, and that's your new set of rules. And then you run the pump again. Okay? So you distribute it out, you run it to glucose, and you get the next set of clauses. Okay? So existing, this, is, this turns out to be different than existing parallel SAT solvers. Either they're doing a static partitioning of the state space, or they're what are called portfolio solvers, where you have different sequential solvers or the same sequential solver with some different parameters that are sort of competing. But there's no exchange of information. And, uh, and, and uh, what we have is some way where we're doing dynamic partitioning of the state space. Each thing, each solver works independently, but then contributes information back uh, to, the, to the sort of central command. So this is good because it reuses existing uh, engineering results from the glucose solver. These are sort of standard techniques, but uh, it would have been complicated for us to, to implement, the, uh, implement them again. So how does it work? Well, uh, we use some benchmarks. We happen to use the benchmarks from 2013. We gave things a timeout of 1,000 seconds. And this is, so this is a, a, what's called a cactus plot. that shows how many examples uh, 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 you were able to solve in time less than a certain amount. Okay? And so lower and to the right is better. So this line is good. So for the satisfiable examples, it's a big win. For the unsatisfiable examples, we don't quite know what's going on here. We're ahead for a long time, and then we kind of fail kind of at the end. We haven't figured that, uh, that out yet. OK, let me, um, let, me, let me start to wrap up. So what I've talked about is a way of connecting abstract interpretation to logic in a way where each provides benefits to the other. So from the standpoint of program analysis, we used the connection to create tools that automate construction of static anal an analyzers. Here, the key takeaway is the notion of symbolic abstraction. Okay. On the other side, we have used abstract interpretation methods to improve the solvers themselves, something that we call satisfiability modulo abstraction. So this gives us a way of creating more powerful solvers by using existing concepts from abstract interpretation. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned midway through the talk, this idea of symbolic abstraction is dual use. Uh, the, the picture for this unsatisfiability checking is this. If the best value, that, the best descriptor that describes this formula is bottom, then the formula is unsatisfiable. Picture for uh, uh, the picture on the abstract interpretation side is, is this one. You don't have to reach bottom for the value to be interesting. That as long as you're working from above, the useful, the residual is useful in program analysis. I said earlier that when phrased in purely logical terms, symbolic abstraction was a fundamental question about approximation in logic. I didn't find things in the math literature about this question, but eventually I did make connections to other areas in computer science, uh, in, uh, in particular uh, in automated reasoning, in knowledge compilations. The, uh, the AI literature had some stuff about con consequence finding, and the database literature has stuff about uh, 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 data integration. So let me stop at this point. I'll give a brief plug for two recent PhD theses. This is my own student, Aditya Thakur, who finished uh, in 2014. Leo Haller, the, the Oxford work, was discussed in Leo Haller's uh, thesis uh, the year before. Uh, and also, uh, there's this paper that I mentioned earlier 
that talks about not just the symbolic abstraction question, but these other efforts that I've made in the way of, uh, with the goal of automating abstract interpretation. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming in the rain. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, I mean, uh, the one thing I uh, took away from your talk is, you know, seeing there is a lot more connection between, you know, this sort of engineering, this form of method, and, uh, you know, what the AI people are doing in knowledge of the people who are doing that sort of thing, what I'm doing. And uh, in particular, uh, and maybe that's one way to look at uh, abstract interpretation. You know, if you can say that, it's just uh, one way to try to come up with some, uh, you know, maybe decidable procedures. And, uh, and so it's sort of, I don't know, uh, and uh, come up with your work on, on this uh, certifiability. So you're saying, well, instead of using, you know, standard technique, you can use abstract interpretation, and then maybe give you another way to speed up the set. And, 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 uh, so I don't know, I mean, uh, so, the, um, so maybe my question is, so now you have this tool, and uh, so what do you think will be sort of a killer application? You know, the, some kind of software that you can do, and for maybe, you know, verification, so, you know. Well, so my, my dream is to make things push button, where I can specify declaratively the, uh, the analyses that I want to do. And write down, just remember my analogy at the beginning was I wanted to automate abstract interpretation to the same degree that Yak and Bison automated Tyler generation. So what do you do when you're using Yak? You write down a context-free grammar, you write down some semantic uh, actions, press a button, namely you invoke Yak, you then invoke the C compiler, and what you get out is something that you can load with the rest of your program, and it handles all the parsing problem completely. In order to do that, you just had very simple conceptual models that you had to deal with, namely context-free grammars and whatever syntax trees you were building. So that's, that's what I would like to do. I'd like to have declarative specification of, uh, of, the, of the actions of the system that I'm trying to model. So that's the semantics of the programming language. For that, we're going to use logic. And then, uh, uh, with each of these procedures, either the Stallmark procedure or the, or the uh, symbolic abstraction from below procedure, there is a, an interface that I have to be able to provide in the domain. So that is probably going to be an implementation of a C++ or Java class with a, with a handful, a small handful of operations. And once I have that cluster of, of things assembled, I'm just going to be pressing a button to have those processed and have it compiled. And now I have something that drops into a, uh, a, a, an analysis tool to provide a new analysis component that can play with other analysis components that would be developed in the same way. But I like that. I mean, that's exactly what we have been trying to do. You know, I mean, have some kind of that party press a button and you know what's true or not true. And so, so do you think, you know, the, um, with in the tool you have, and uh, let's say you apply it to program verification. You have a program, you have precondition, post condition, and now you try, you know, to this uh, abstract interpretation. Do you think it's uh, compatible with the, you know, the, the best, uh, you know, way I using, let's say, you know, group invariant? And, and so it, so I, th I think maybe the, um, uh, to, to make it com uh, a comparison with something where you're providing loop invariance is maybe not the right question. It would be more, how does it compare with tools that you can either buy from companies like Grammatech or Coverity uh, and, and, or download from academic research sites? And the answer there is kind of uh, 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 good, and, good and bad. There's good news and bad news. So. The good news is that, in principle, we have been able to cr do these push button, create, create these push button tools. The bad news is, uh, is that they are, in general, fairly slow because they are using techniques from 
solvers, essentially. We've cannibalized Stallmark's method. We've cannibalized uh, CDCL solvers. Okay? And if, if they're compared with sort of standard program analysis techniques, they're slow. So there's work to be done there to try and make these things faster. On the other hand, the good news or the potential is that if you have to do something that is subtle or uh, complicated, if you, if you need to work with a complicated abstract domain, if you try and do it in the conventional way by hand, you're going to get it wrong. Because I've been there, and I know that we got it wrong, and we got it wrong, and we got it wrong, and then maybe we got it right. Whereas with these push button techniques, much more likely to be able to eliminate the bugs and get something that works. So if you have something that is, is working with a complicated abstract domain. So I, I keep thinking, although obviously I, I can't go back and redo Astre, but for each of the problems where the, the ENS graduate students devised a new abstract domain, and some of these were fairly complicated, in principle, this kind of, these kind of techniques could be applied. And hopefully it would have sped it up from being an ENS uh, PhD dissertation worthy project to something that can be pulled off in a matter of days or, or weeks. So that's the hope. So, uh, I mean, maybe another way to put my, my question is like, uh, you know, you have a program. There's so many things you want to know about. You may want to, let's say, do a vacation. And you may want to know whether there is a memory overflow. That's the way you now access memory leak and so on. And right. So 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 what do you think? I mean for the tool of young people, so what type of uh, properties about the program can your tool be best? Is it for you know Ooh, uh, so I guess I'm I've been working at a at a meta level. Uh, so this is this is uh, this is methodology this is uh, tools and methodology that can be used to answer whatever you want. Okay? And you may find that for, for some of these techniques, you know, so probably for null pointer dereference, you might be better off uh, just doing it by hand in the conventional way. But if you're after shape analysis, you might be better off doing it this way. Let me also um, mention one thing which I sort of skipped over in the talk. One thing that you may want to do when you're, dealing, when you're creating a, a static analysis tool is to use multiple abstract domains. You may want to use parity analysis and shape analysis and constant propagation and, and whatnot. And the conventional way of doing this is that you have to have communication so that each domain can influence the, the descriptors in each of the other domains. If you have symbolic abstraction, symbolic concretization and symbolic abstraction, you can think of the logic as a kind of whiteboard where each domain contributes something on the whiteboard. And then you can take the conjunction of those formulas. Then each domain pulls back using the symbolic abstraction method. Okay? So the conventional, so here's an example. So if you know that A is even, B is odd, you don't know anything about C. Here you know that A is between 3 and 12, B is between 5 and 10, and C is 7. Okay? Here I've used bounded arithmetic, which is why there are these high powers of 2. Uh, 2 to the 31 times a equals 0 is a way of saying that a is even. Okay? Anyway, you pull these back, you will have found that you've gone to a lower value. a is even, b is odd, c is odd. Why is c odd? Because this contributed to 7 and 7, and 7 is odd. Okay? Similarly, over here, uh, if you knew that a was even, then a could not possibly be 3, and so you've sharpened your interval from 3 to 12 to 4 to 12. So uh, the normal way of doing this is a kind of clique approach, that you have to have communication among all of these domains. But if you have the symbolic, uh, well, and in the clique approach, if you have a new domain, a new idea of, of a domain, you have to then have ways of translating to all of these. But with a symbolic abstraction approach, everything is just contributing, has to speak the same logic that they put on the whiteboard. And if you have a new domain, you just have to say, how its descriptors are described in the logic and invoke one of the symbolic abstraction methods for pulling information back off of the whiteboard. So again, this is sort of another level of, uh, of, of uh, help that you get. 
by, by constructing things around this, around this primitive. Um, yeah. I'm curious about one application of your approach. Um, as we know, the strength of the abstract notation is to build the collections about the, like, the numerical variables. I mean, all you talk about is the variables that are in integers, floats, or some numerical values, right? But it's the one famous shortcoming of the abstract notation is to describe the invariance of data structures, but which is, the abstract, which is, is just the strength of the uh, symbolic domain. Right. For example, we always write the data structure like a Q, for example, it's a Q. And there is a field called size. And there is a, there is a, uh, and there is a buffer. Right? And uh, the size, uh, the size equal to zero means there is nothing in the Q. Right? And, uh, and, uh, uh, but we cannot build a collection, which is the size equal to zero means the buffer is empty. Well, size equals a uh, 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 value k means there are k elements in the queue, right? So we cannot describe such uh, such environment, right? No, I, I don't. St I don't. You started with a, a misconception. Your premise that abstract interpretation only applies to numeric variables is completely wrong. So if you look at the work that Muli Sagiv and Reinhard Wilhelm and I did on shape analysis, that is expressed in abstract inter interpretation terms. In fact, we abstracted away so that we couldn't even talk about numeric variables. We could only talk about shapes. But you can combine those things. The kind of thing that you're talking about, actually, uh, if we go back to the kind of picture that I had where, uh, where you think about the abstract domain as being a logic fragment, uh, it would be an interesting exercise to work out an appropriate logic fragment for describing your buffers. And then it is really just... Uh, I mean, that would be a, a set of descriptors, and you would, we would have to figure out uh, the, the, the lattice uh, operations for, uh, for doing the manipulations of those descriptors. But I, 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 I don't buy your premise. Uh, in fact, I maintain the opposite, which is that all the things that you want to describe in a, a static analysis tool are covered by the theory of abstract interpretation. Because those... Uh, contribution is absolutely fundamental, not just in, uh, uh, in program analysis, but actually in all sorts of approximation problems all over computer science. It's just it, the rest of computer science has not heard about it. But we're in program analysis, and that is the right model for, for phrasing these, uh, for, for thinking about these problems. Uh, if um if we were to apply this to analyze uh, more simple problems, probably such as the range of uh, a variable, uh, so what are the things that a, a programmer need to do uh, in terms of automating the whole, generating the whole uh, interpreter? So is it to determine the uh, Abstract, uh, the abstract domain, the lattice for the abstract domain, or choosing the right uh, f uh, logic, f logic formulas, or what are the things so, that they need to do? So, uh, I mean, part of it is, has to do with the way the work that's come out of my group is sort of structured. But we have worked on both um, uh, constraint solvers or, or equation solvers. Um, like weighted pushdown systems and recently this Newtonian program analysis solver. Those are, are things which are, you have a set of equations where each of the equations has a, a right-hand side where that right-hand side is one of these abstract transformers. So the two pieces, so, so you can sort of divide the world in two parts. There's the part where, which says acquire the abstract transformers from the program and then and, and from the program, you would then get a set of equations, and then take one of these off-the-shelf equation solvers and run those to get the to get the final answer, to get the properties that your that your analysis is able to extract from the program. So, the, on the on on the on my left-hand side, it would be creating the abstract domain, creating the um, symbolic concretization function. Uh, if, if my dream of a uh, push-button tool exists, then the symbolic abstraction algorithms would be uh, 
provided for you automatically. I mean, they would be part of the sort of package that, w that uh, this tool would provide. And, and we would also have these equation solvers for you as well. So it would be a matter of designing the abstract domains, and then pressing the button. And would this package be available? <laughs> I think that was one other question up there. Right. I think it is pretty hard to translate concrete uh, execution to symbolic uh, constraints, but uh, I think the, the problem is, is hard after your presentation because uh, I believe that your method can make ex existing tools better, but I, I think some, some problems such as very complex uh, uh, expressions and uh, unknown third-party libraries are, are still hard to deal with. So, uh, in a word, I think your tool can make uh, the existing constraint solvers work better, but I, I don't think it can solve with the, the existing very hard problems. Well, so remember, we are solving, we are tr attempting to solve undecidable problems. So, we're going to have some degree of failure uh, we know that right off the bat that we're going to have some degree of failure. Now, in terms of uh, what we can solve, I guess one thing I should point out is that we ended up with these two methods, one that works from below and one that works from above. Now, they have different interfaces. The one that worked from below required to have a satisfiability or SMT solver in hand that could uh, give you back satisfying assignments. So that requires you to be able to state the concrete semantics in a decidable logic, okay? Whereas the one that works from above, even if you're working with an, an undecidable logic, you may be able to build uh, sort of um, um, best effort solvers. So I don't know that, you know, the logicians haven't provided us a term. They've provided us the term decision procedure, but there needs to be a term for not quite a decision procedure, but best effort. And so I think the, the, the way I would say, if you present me with a problem that is too hard, I will pick and choose among my techniques. Obviously, I can't solve problems that computer science uh, or logic tell me are undecidable. But I can have techniques that, work, that on a best effort basis can make progress and perhaps solve some, degree, some percentage, hopefully some large percentage of the problems that you would present me. I come from computer architecture background, so my question may sound a bit trivial or something. Uh, how does this abstract interpretation compare or stand with respect to other ways of analyzing program components, like say polyhedral compilation? Po polyhedral compilation? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by polyhedral compilation. So you have this polyhedral compilation framework which helps you in, in reasoning about loops in a program. So, and this is also another way of reasoning about programs. So, if I were to select one of these two approaches, because uh, in, in the hardware synthesis community, polyhedral compilation is being used and studied, uh, and this is something new to me. So, how does this compare with, with say, uh, those other approaches? So, I, I, uh, I'm uh, answering on the sort of the shifting sands here, because I don't know exactly uh, the, the work that you're referring to, but it sounds to me like there are descriptors of states that are involved and that you have various rules for manipulating or transforming the program depending on what these descriptors say about the states that arise in the program. So this methodology of abstract interpretation is a way of uh, formalizing the correctness of those descriptors and giving you ways of proving that what you're doing with those descriptors, in fact, do reflect the properties of the program uh, under all possible scenarios. And so it would perhaps be an interesting exercise to, uh, to look at what you're describing and then give an account in abstract interpretation terms. The specific techniques that I described here uh, would be ways of carrying out the computations on these descriptors, uh, perhaps in a different way than is conventionally done uh, by the whoever it is that, uh, that, that does this work currently. So I'd be interested in references. Maybe after the talk, you could give me some references. 
I'm just saying, just saying using the abstraction invert uh, using the abstract invitation to improve the, the the capability of checking the unsatisfiability of a uh, decision uh, constraints, right? This um, I'm curious of if can we just like uh, have some method to using abstract invitation to simplify the constraints and then the simplified constraint can preserve the unsat results. I mean, I mean, sometimes maybe it's hard to check. Uh, this is sad one, but it's hard, it's really hard, right? But we can simplify constraints. And after simplification, the result of unsat is preserved. And I mean, if the original constraint is unsat, then the transform constraint is also unsat. But if original is sad, maybe it is, becomes unsat. Well, so this, this Stallmark method is really, you can think of it in, in, as a way of expressing simplifications. Uh, the, the propagation rules are, are taking information, say definite information about the value of one Boolean variable v, and telling you about what the possibilities are for variables v prime and v double prime. Maybe because v is true, then you know that, you don't know the values of v and v prime, but you know that they have to have the same value. The v prime is equivalent to v double prime. So that can be thought of as a kind of simplification. The, the Stallmark method itself is just sort of taking this to an extreme, plus adding the dilemma rule, which can sometimes serve as a, as a pump, to pump things down lower than you could if you were just trying to drive things with pure simplification. So I think it actually goes beyond the idea of simplification. Uh, and then the, the, on the abstract interpretation side is, uh, it's important, I mean, it's an important idea even if you don't get to bottom. That, I think, is something that is, is, is new. It's a message that I would like to somehow communicate to the decision procedure people. And maybe slowly that message is getting, uh, is getting out there. All right, so let's uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Reps again for the wonderful lecture.